find uh, it very am I am I not am, am I not supposed to see you guys? <laughs> yes, yes, you are. Well, I'm not right now. I'm just seeing a uh, right now. I'm seeing myself. I look pretty good, but <laughs> not, okay. Like, I can tell you one thing: we look pretty good too. So, <laughs> okay, now I can now I can see something. Yeah, now I can see something. On yeah, thank you. So, can you okay. see us now? Yeah, I can see uh, an audience, and I can see. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, you look good. Do we look good too? You look fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. So, I think this is a name that truly. I think it does not need any introduction. We are super excited and we want to thank you for your work. We want to thank you for what you're doing. We want to thank you for taking the chance to speak up what you had in your gut that went against what everyone thought or did. And I know we know you have not arrived here easy. It looks yeah. easy. Success looks amazing, but you've taken your road. So we just wanted to say thank you for being here and we're not gonna delay anymore. And can we give Dr. Gabor Mate a big round of applause? Thank you. So just tell me, I know I have an hour and a half with you. Now tell me how you like it to go. You'd like me to speak for a while or, or is it gonna be an interview or conversation? Or, or or first I should talk and then take questions. How do you want to do this? Yes, um, you can talk for as long as you want. And okay. I think it's like an hour. And then maybe the last half an hour, we can do uh, Q&A. Q &A. Okay, very good. Now, I know this should be clear, but I just want to make sure that I know what am I talking about? What would you like me to speak on? What would you like me to address? <laughs> Well, one, one uh, second, Dr. Gabor, can you see me? Hi. Uh, I'm right here. I'm going to come close. Well, just um, what, sub what subject would you like me to address in this talk? The myth of normal. Okay, got it. Thank you. All right. So I'll begin and I'll speak for about, you know, 50, 55 minutes and then take questions. But how do you want to do it? Do you want to do it? Talk for 40? I mean, how do you want to do it? Because you asked us how we want to do it. No, I, I'm I just I just do what they tell me to do. You know, I don't know. Oh, no. well, I, I don't we, have an independent mind of my own. I just Oh, you don't. OK. Do All right. <laughs> okay. OK, well, I'm very happy to speak about this idea of the myth of normal. So just as a background. Um, so I was trained as a as a physician. I worked as a family doctor for um, 22 years. I also worked in palliative care. I was the uh, medical coordinator of uh, a palliative care unit here, looking after dying people here in Vancouver. So really, I did everything from deliver babies to looking after people in the last weeks and days of their lives and everything in between. For 12 years, I also worked, as many of you know, in... Um, Vancouver's downtown east side, which is uh, Canada's, in fact, North America's, in fact, the Western world's most concentrated area of drug use with people addicted to, you know, opiates and cocaine and stimulants of all kinds, alcohol, everything. And in the course of my experience as a physician, and I also have to put in the the information that it wasn't just my experience as a physician, but also my experience as a human being, because I had issues of my own. And uh, uh, I went through depression and I was a workaholic. I had other addictive behaviors, problems in my marriage, problems as a parent. And in terms of what I observed in myself and clinically in my patients, the medical model that was taught to me began to make less and less sense because in the medical model, we separate the mind from the body and we separate the individual from the environment. So let me give you an example. I'm going to ask you as a question and I can kind of see the room on a small screen here on, on the top of my computer so I can see 
see what you do. Um, I'm going to ask you a question. If you've been to a medical specialist, a respirologist, a cardiologist, a gastroenterologist, a neurologist, uh, does my cat, okay, excuse me, a neurologist, um, immunologist, um, rheumatologist, in the life five, last five or 10 years, any kind of an ologist, okay, just raise your hand, would you? Just raise your hand. Okay, now, thank you, put your hands down. Raise your hand if they ask you about childhood trauma in your life. Raise your hand if they ask you about how you feel about yourself as a human being. Raise your hand if they ask you about how you feel about your work. Raise your hand if they ask you about how stressful is your relationship with your partner or spouse if you have one. Well, what I'm saying to you is that all the questions that they didn't ask you, these questions that I just um, raised, actually had everything to do with why 95% of the time you were at the doctors in the first place. And how that is the case is what I'll be telling you about. But fundamentally what I learned is that in human life, you cannot separate the emotions from the physiology, the mind from the body, nor can you separate the individual from the environment. And this is not, so whether you're trying to understand addictions or whether you're trying to understand in autoimmune disease, like rheumatoid arthritis or multiple sclerosis or chronic fatigue or colitis or malignancy or asthma or depression or anxiety or ADHD, you can't look for the causes inside the individual. It's not genetically determined most of the time and it's not purely a biological phenomenon. But that the biology itself is a reflection of a person's life. And there's an American physician in 1977 called George Engel. He was a psychiatrist and a physician. And he called for what he called a biopsychosocial view of medicine, which means that the biology of human beings is inseparable from their psyches, from their psychology, or from their social context. So biopsychosocial. That's our true nature. Now, what is ultimately puzzling and frustrating about all this is that this unity has been fully demonstrated and proven by modern science. So these links are not just matters of insight. They're also uh, matters of established science. And yet this science is not taught in the medical schools. I'll give you an example. Um, and a study from Harvard University four years ago showed that, that women with severe post-traumatic stress disorder have doubled the risk of ovarian cancer. And the milder the symptoms, the lower the risk for cancer which means that there's a huge connection between emotions and the physiology. But we don't talk about this in medical circles. It also means, potentially, that if you help people heal from trauma, you're preventing physical illness. There's been all kinds of studies showing the relationship between trauma, stress, and multiple sclerosis. But the average neurologist never hears about these studies. And these studies are not published in sort of minor publications. They appear in major scientific and medical journals. But they sort of don't stick in the medical mind. Now, PTSD is not an individual problem. It happens in a context. It's a social issue. Nobody develops PTSD sitting in a room by themselves. So it is biopsychosocial. We know that 
race has a lot to do with it. Not so much race as racism. For example, studies have shown that the more episodes of racism an American black woman experiences, the greater the risk for asthma. Now, asthma means inflammation of the airways and narrowing of the airways. And that is potentiated by stress. We've known for decades, for decades, for multiple studies, that the more stressed parents are, the more likely the child is to have asthma, the child. And the more stressed and mentally disturbed the parents are, the more medication a child will need for their asthma. Now, these are not new insights. Um, 2,300 years ago, Plato, the Greek philosopher, wrote that the problem with the doctors of today, he said 2,300 years ago, is that they separate the mind from the body. 2,400 years ago. The first physician who described multiple sclerosis, this neurological disorder, uh, was a French neurologist called Jean-Martin Charcot, and he said this illness is due to stress. In 1896, a great Canadian-American-British physician, Sir William Osler, said that rheumatoid arthritis was due to stress. In 1870, a great British surgeon um, who operated on breast cancer, he said that breast cancer is indubitably connected to women's emotional states. What these pioneers didn't know, well, I'm sorry, they knew it. But what they didn't have was scientific evidence. They just had their own observations. Just like I began to notice these uh, patterns in my own family practice. And the, again, the frustrating thing is, is that since, since we have developed, um, since these pioneers made these observations, we've now had decades, 100 years of science to prove the accuracy of these observations. And again, my particular um, beef, I should say, with my profession is not that we're too scientific, it's that we're not scientific enough. We don't look at the science that doesn't support our ideology. And I have to tell you, medicine is not just a science. Now, just to be clear, modern medicine has got incredible achievements. I mean, I'm... I'm not questioning any of that. It's, 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 it's miraculous what physicians can do these days. But in a fairly narrow sense, what we don't do very well with is chronic illnesses. The best we can say is you've got this disease. We don't know what causes it. You will have it for the rest of your life. Nothing we can do about it except to give you medications for the symptoms. That's for most chronic illnesses. Meanwhile, there's all, all this evidence coming in for decades. For example, autoimmune conditions where the immune system attacks the body. For example, systemic lupus. The more socially stressed you are, the more likely to have these conditions. So women of color and Hispanic women in the US already 50, 60 years ago were shown to have elevated risks for autoimmune disease, particularly lupus. If you look at who gets autoimmune disease in general, 70, 80%, about 80% happens to women. And everybody says, this is a big mystery. Well, as you'll hear from me, this is not a mystery at all. And then we talk about mental health issues like addiction and we say it's a genetic brain disorder no it isn't i'll try to find a few minutes to talk about addictions a little bit later on but what i'm saying is what's missing in the medical ideology and to go back to what i said about ideology so medicine is a science yes in significant and beautiful ways but it's also an also an ideology an ideology it's a way of thinking that allows in certain information 
and doesn't let in other information. You see this in political ideologies. When people are committed to a certain point of view, it doesn't matter what the evidence is, that evidence doesn't penetrate. And you can see that today in the world. We can see it tragically in the Middle East. How it doesn't matter what happens. I'm not going to express my own views here. But my heart has been heavy for the last five months. My heart has been breaking for the last five months. And yet the evidence for some people just doesn't penetrate. That's ideological. So any ideology is an invisible screen that lets in some information but keeps out other information that doesn't fit with the ideology. And medicine in that sense is largely is an ideology as well as a science. So let me plunge in here then to well, how do I see the sources of illness? And by the way, let me say one more thing. Our language is very revealing. We talk about people having an illness. So people say, I have ADHD or I have rheumatoid arthritis, or I have chronic fatigue. Now that seems like a normal way to speak, and I suppose it is, but there's a hidden assumption in it, if you'll notice. The assumption is that there's a thing called the disease, then there's an entity called me, and I have that thing, but the two are separate. So I have a cell phone, right? I have a cell phone. I can put it down, turn it on, turn it off. But it's an object outside me, outside of me. <clears throat> when I say that I have ADHD, or I have multiple sclerosis, or I have cancer, I'm assuming there's this independent entity with a life of its own that has somehow entered my body. Whereas... That's not what diseases are. They're not independent things. They're not independent of who you are, how you live your life, what has happened to you, the traumas that you've experienced, the stressors that you face, whether they're racial or personal or multi-generational. Those processes are not independent. And the good news is, and this is why this is important to understand, to go back to that study about ovarian cancer and post-traumatic stress disorder. If we can affect our lives and live our lives differently with a different awareness, it follows that that can affect the process that the disease manifests. So it's not just a question of fighting the disease. We keep talking about the war on cancer and fighting a disease. Well, that's one way to look at it. But the other way to look at it is that we can understand that process and learn what it has to teach us. And I don't recommend disease of mind or body. In fact, there's no separation. I don't recommend diseases as a way of learning. I don't wish it on anybody. But when it comes along, it can teach us a lot. So... In the myth of normal, um, this book of mine that this um, talk is based on, there's a chapter entitled um, Disease as Teacher. And let me just come to it for a moment. The chapter is entitled A Dreadful Gift, Disease as Teacher. I don't wish it on anybody. But what can it teach us? So there was a book published um, maybe 12 years ago now, by a nurse who worked in palliative care, like I used to, looking after dying people. And she wrote a book called The Top Five Regrets of Dying People. Now, these are people who died before their time, not people who died at old age, you know, but people who developed chronic disease, malignancy. Before their time, you know what the top regret of dying people was? That they weren't themselves. 
that they live their lives trying to please and fit in with other people's expectations. That was the top regret. And I used to hear the same thing in palliative care. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you something strange or seemingly strange. It wouldn't be unusual for me to hear from a patient saying, Doc, I don't want to say this exactly, but this disease that's going to kill me is the best thing that ever happened to me. And what do you think people were talking about? What they were talking about is that the disease finally connected them to themselves and they got to know themselves fully and be in the present fully. Now, again, I don't recommend going that route, but that's what people were talking about. So not being yourself is the top regret of people who die before their time. So going back to this chapter in the myth of normal uh, called a dreadful gift, disease is teacher, teacher, let me quote you the, um, the great singer uh, and songwriter, uh, Cheryl Crow, who I'm sure many of you know. And she developed breast cancer. And what did she say? After her diagnosis and her treatment, she said, surviving breast cancer redefined who I am and how I am. Until then, I'd spent a lifetime being a caretaker for everyone around me. From then, I started to put myself first. I had voices at the back of my head telling me whatever I did wasn't good enough. Now, finally, I've silenced them. So she found herself. She found herself. And the question is, how did she lose herself in the first place? So when I was working in family practice, I noticed that who got sick and who didn't get sick wasn't exactly an accidental. And I did have an advantage over my specialist colleagues. They knew much more about a particular part of the body or a particular organ or system in the body and its pathology than I ever would. Of course, and that's good. But they didn't know the patient before they got sick. I knew people before they got sick. I knew their families. If I listened and looked carefully enough, I understood their multi-generational family histories. And it began to strike me that who got sick and who didn't wasn't accidental. There were certain traits associated with chronic illness. Now, by the way, going back to Cheryl Crow, when she said that until then I spent a lifetime being a caretaker for everyone around me. Remember when I said that women are much more likely to get autoimmune disease? They're also more likely to get non-smoking related cancers. Also, if they smoke, they have the double the risk of a guy than a guy who smokes. Why do you suppose women? It's not biologically determined is because who in this culture is programmed to suppress themselves and their feelings and to serve the needs of others while ignoring their own. And those are the characteristics that very often precede illness. So I'm going to read you some newspaper clippings to illustrate the point. Uh, this is from a Canadian newspaper. So the first case um, is a woman who um, is got breast cancer and she wrote this article herself uh, for the newspaper and she's married to a guy whose first wife died of breast cancer now she the second wife is diagnosed with the same condition so she writes the doctor tells me that the lump is small and most assuredly not in my lymph nodes unlike that of my husband's first wife whose cancer had spread everywhere by the time they found it. You're not going to die, he reassures me. But I'm worried about my husband, I say. I won't have the strength to support him. So what do you notice? She's the one that's diagnosed with, doesn't matter what the doctor says, a potentially fatal illness. She might have to have surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, who knows. And her first and automatic thought is, how will I help my husband? So this automatic and compulsive concern with the emotional needs of others while ignoring your own is a major risk factor for disease for reasons that I'll explain to you. 
the others I'll read you are obituaries, and obituaries are illuminating because very often um, they describe characteristics that I think contributed to the early death of the loved one. So this is a doctor who died in Toronto for, of cancer. He was 55 years old. And this is what the obituary said. Never for a day did he contemplate giving up the work he so loved at Toronto's Sick Children's Hospital. He carried on with his duties throughout his year-long battle with cancer, stopping only a few days before he died. So this compulsive and rigid identification with duty, role, and responsibility, which means I am what I do out there in the world. That's a major risk factor for the disease. The third one is illustrated by an obituary written by a grateful husband. Grateful not that his wife died, but he's grateful to his wife for the way she had been. And she was 55. She died of breast cancer. And the husband writes, in her entire life, she never got into a fight with anyone. The worst she could say was fui or something else along those lines. She had no ego. She just blended in with the environment in an unassuming manner. Well, uh, I've made this joke before, but if you've heard it, forgive me, but there's also truth in it. You know, I've been married now for 54 and a half years and to Ray, my wife, and uh, believe me, there were plenty of times when I wished that she would blend in with the environment in an unassuming manner, you know, and I'm sure you felt the same way if you're in a relationship, but not good if they do. Because what's being described here, this very nice personality never getting into a fight, what do you suppose is being described? What's being described is the suppression of healthy anger. And I'll tell you that the repression of healthy anger actually undermines the immune system. And I might as well explain to you why right now. Think of it this, first of all, the immune system and the emotional apparatus, the psyche, the nervous system and the hormonal apparatus are not different systems. They're one system. That's been studied for close to 100 years now. The science that studies it is called psychoneuroimmunology, or to give it its full name, psychoneuroimmunoendocrinology. It means basically that hormones, nerves, emotions, immunity, it's part of the same system the different aspects of the same system. Now, what is the role of healthy anger? And we know from studies that suppressing healthy anger or repressing it suppresses the immune system. Now, what healthy anger? What is the role of healthy anger? Because we're wired for it, you know? We're wired for certain emotions. I talk about all this in the myth of normal. We're wired for anger, for love, for grief, for sadness, for fear, for lust, for playfulness, for curiosity. We have to be wired for all this because all these emotions are necessary for not just human, but mammalian life. So we share these circuits with other mammals, much more sophisticated, of course, than human beings. Now, what is the role of healthy anger in mammalian life? It's very simple. Your boundaries are threatened or somebody invades your boundaries and you say, no, stay out, my space. That's healthy anger. It preserves your boundaries. It's healthy because it prevents you having to come to a fight. It also healthy because it protects you. Now, if you look at the role of emotions in general, what is the role of the emotional system? Basically, it's twofold. It's to let in what is nurturing and um, welcome and supportive and what is loving and to keep out what is dangerous or toxic or unwelcome. That's the role of the emotional system. So some people you want to bring very close to you, hold them. Others, you don't want them anywhere near you. And if they approach, you better 
And if they don't, if they don't respect your boundaries, you better have healthy anger. Because if you don't, you'll be stressed all the time. So the role of emotions is to let in what is healthy, nurturing, and loving, and to keep out what it isn't. Now, difficult question for you. What is the role of the immune system? If you think about it for a moment, you realize it's exactly the same. The immune system has been called a floating brain. It's called memory. It's got rec recognition capacity. It's got reactive capacity, just like the brain. And it's got learning capacity. It learns what is healthy and what isn't. And it lets in what is nurturing and nutritive and supportive of life. And it keeps out or destroys what isn't. So the emotional system and the immune system have exactly the same role. And they're not separate systems. So when you suppress, repress one aspect of the system, one aspect of the system, you're affecting the other aspects. It's really that simple, physiologically and psychologically. So that's the third characteristic of the disease-prone personality. Um, the fourth one is illustrated by yet another obituary. Uh, this one, you have to believe me, I didn't make it up because it seems a bit almost ludicrous, but it's tragic. Uh, this is a doctor who died in Ottawa, Canada, age 72, of cancer. And this is the obituary. It says, Sydney, that was his name, and his mother had an incredibly special relationship, a bond that was apparent in all aspects of their lives until her, the mother's death. As a married man with young children, Sidney made a point to have dinner with his parents every day as his wife, Rosalind, and their four kids waited for him at home, greeted by yet another, he would walk in, greeted by yet another dinner to eat and to enjoy. Never wanting to disappoint either woman in his life, Sidney kept eating two dinners a day for years until gradual weight gain began to raise suspicions. So this poor man suffers from two, suffered from two fatal beliefs. So when I say fatal, I mean fatal. One is that he's responsible for other people feel. And the other is he must never disappoint anybody. So let, give you an, let me give you an obvious example. Okay, so I, I've been um, invited uh, today to speak to you. And, um, and uh, Gigi from Hope From Life um, invited me. Now, I can say yes, I can say no. If there's space in my life and I honor my pleasure at working with her, then I'll say yes. But what if I was over busy? What if I was overbooked? What if I was really tired already? And by the way, I have been that way at times because of my workaholism. <clears throat> and I still say, yes, I don't say no. Then I'm going to accept the invitation. What's going to be the impact? I'm going to be tired. I'm going to be stressed. Why? Because I think I'm responsible for how she feels. And I mustn't disappoint her. But the fact is, I'm not responsible for how somebody feels. If I say no, because I'm too busy, too tired, whatever, if they feel upset, that's too bad. But I didn't cause that. That's because of their expectations. I'm not responsible for their expectations. And I'm not responsible for the disappointment. I'm responsible for what I do but not for how other people feel about it. You know, when I say I'm responsible for what I do, I'm responsible that I'm not being unfair to somebody or intrusive or aggressive, rude, any of that. I'm responsible for that. But I'm not responsible for how they feel if I simply, if I simply assert my own needs. So... Those are the four traits then, um, typical. And the reason they lead to chronic illness is because 
if you're always concerned with others, and if you identify just with your duty and your role, and if you suppress your healthy anger, and if you're afraid of disappointing people, you're going to be stressed all the time. Because you won't be saying no, which means you're going to be carrying a huge burden all the time, whether you know it or not. And that stress undermines your, um, your um, physiology. Stress, chronic stress, suppresses the immune system, thins your bones, ulcerates your intestines, puts fat on your belly, increasing the risk of heart disease, makes you depressed, changes in a negative way the functioning of your chromosomes, causes inflammation in the body, promotes the risk of malignancy, turns off cancer-protecting genes, turns on cancer-causing genes. No wonder the people with these traits, which lead to chronic stress, are more likely to develop disease. It also means, and I could name you many examples of it. I could even show you photographs, but I just, that would mean screen sharing and I just don't want to go through that hassle. That when people develop an illness and they recognize these patterns in themselves and they learn about the traumas that cause these patterns to develop in them because nobody's born with them and they reverse them, their illness can also significantly turn for the better and sometimes completely go away. And I know many examples of that. But now the question is, how to develop these traits in the first place? Well, this is where childhood experience comes into it. So nobody's born with those traits. No, no, no one day old baby is worried about disappointing mommy and daddy. You know, no one day old baby lies there thinking, oh my God, it's four in the morning, I'm wet, and I'm uncomfortable, and I'm hungry, but gee, poor mommy and daddy are working so hard, I better not cry because it will bother them. And it's my responsibility how they feel. I mean, I guarantee you, no one day old baby does that. But something happens. Something happens. Now I'm gonna ask you another question, and I'm gonna raise for another show of hands. If you've had the following experience of having a strong gut feeling about something and ignoring it, and then you were sorry afterwards, just raise your hand, okay? I see many hands, most hands usually. Now, you just told me the story of your childhood because no infant is ever disconnected from their gut feelings. We're born connected. Something happens. Now, here's what happens. The child, the child has needs. Now, one of the essential needs of the child is for what we call attachment. And attachment means proximity, being close to somebody for the purpose of being taken care of. And obviously, the mammalian infant, whether it's a little rat, or a little mouse, or a little bear, or a little human, can't survive without that attachment relationship. So that attachment is wired into our brains. And we have to stay close and be looked after by the people, nature appointed to that task. So that's attachment. That's a major need. By the way, that's a need even of adults. But, and if you wanna know what, how big a need it is, just look at how you feel when one of your attachment relationships is lost, either because somebody breaks up with you or a friend quarrels with you or somebody dies or somebody you love moves away far so you don't see them, how do you feel? Your attachment instincts are just disturbed. Well, but you don't need those people. You could survive without them. The small child cannot. So for the child, that attachment need is absolute. So that's one need that we have. But the another the other need we have is what I call authenticity, and that's another chapter in the book. Authenticity from the Latin word, sorry, the, from the Greek word, auto, the self. We need to be connected to ourselves. Got feelings? Why? Because recall something. 
We evolved out there in nature. For millions of years, our ancestors lived in nature. For hundreds of thousands of years, human beings lived out there in nature. Until a few thousand years ago, really. Blink of an eye ago. Now, how long does any creature, human or otherwise, survive in nature if they're not connected to their gut feelings? So that connection to ourselves is a huge survival need also. Well, that's fine. But what happens if the two needs come into conflict? They should coexist. But what if they come into conflict? How can they come into conflict? If the child gets the message that they're not acceptable to the parents as they are, the child will try to mold themselves to be acceptable to the parent. Now, I mentioned that one of the needs of children is this unconditional loving acceptance. Another need of the child is the freedom to experience and express and have validated all their emotions by the adults. Now, remember I mentioned that, that book, The Top Five Regrets of Dying People? Another regret was that I didn't express for my emotions for fear of disappointing others. Well, we're not born that way. But if the child gets the message that if I'm angry, my parents will say, time out, get away from me, which the child can't stand, not a young child, it threatens them. Or if the child gets the message that mommy and daddy are so stressed, they can't handle my feelings. And I got that message very early. Then you postpone your feelings in order not to create a conflict or disturbance with the parents. So if there arises a, a pull between attachment on the one hand and authenticity on the other, guess what you sacrifice each time? You sacrifice your authenticity. But the problem is, it's an adaptation. And these early adaptations become wired into the brain, into the psychology, into the body, into the personality. Kids know how to say no. At one and a half, that's what they do say. No, put your shoes on. No. There's an, that's necessary for them to develop their own individuality. But if as if as if as the parents, wittingly or unwittingly, give the child the message that you're expressing your emotions threatens the relationship with me, the child will suppress the emotions. And that then becomes a lifelong pattern. And we're bringing into our work and we're bringing into our personal relationships. We, do, we learn not to say no when there's a no that wants to be said. We suppress ourselves. We take on too much. We stress ourselves. And again, which gender in this society is more acculturated to suppress their healthy anger and to be nice and compliant? Well, it's women. And that's why they have more autoimmune disease. That's when it comes to physical illness. Uh, in the remaining time, I'm going to say some words about what we call mental illness. And... Um, Again, we tend to look at mental illnesses in um, strictly biological terms. That these are diseases of the brain. Depression is a biological disease of the brain. Here's a pill to change the biology of your brain. By the way, sometimes the pills work. I've taken them myself. So this is not an anti-medication rant. But it's a very narrow approach. Because what does it mean to depress something? It means to push it down. What gets pushed down in depression? Your feelings, you become flat. Life becomes meaningless. Why would you push down your feelings? Because you learned that you had to. Because your father was an alcoholic and there was too much strife in the home. So you learned to stay quiet and not create any waves. Or your mother was a depressive. Or your parents were stressed economically or racially or politically. So you learned not to create more stress for your parents. So you pushed, you, you, you repressed, you pushed on your feelings. Then you get diagnosed with this disease called depression or attention deficit problem. 
my first book was I when after I was diagnosed with ADHD in my 50s. It's called Scattered Minds, and it's on attention deficit disorder. That's not an inherited disease either. As a matter of fact, if you actually look at the scientific literature, um, there's no single gene or group of genes that if you inherit them, you'll have a certain mental illness, or if you don't inherit them, you won't. No such genes. There are genes, but the more of them you have, the more likely you are to have any number of mental health conditions. But you're not guaranteed to have them. As a matter of fact, you can have the same genes and have a very fulfilled and happy life. So what are the genes for? They're for sensitivity. The more sensitive you are, and sensitive means from the Latin word sincere, to feel, the more you feel. And the more you feel, the more pain you're going to have when things don't go well. And the more pain you have, the more you have to protect yourself from the pain. But look at attention deficit disorder, tuning out, absent-mindedness. That's not a disease. It's a coping mechanism. When young kids are stressed, when I was stressed as a one-year-old Jewish baby or the first year of my life under Nazi occupation with my mothers in my life under threat almost every day, you think I was a stressed little baby? Sure I was. What would a baby do with the stress? You tune out to protect yourself. That gets wired into the brain. Now my kids have been diagnosed too. A couple of them have. Well, they grew up in peaceful Vancouver. No war here. What happened? But they were born to two traumatized parents who hadn't worked out their trauma yet. So there was a lot of stress in our home. I mean, my wife and I have loved each other. and We always have, and we worked out our issues, and are still working out our issues, by the way. But when our kids were small, we had a very conflictual relationship. And as my core writer in Myth of Normal, Daniel, my eldest son, recalls his childhood. He said, the floor was never the floor. You never knew when the floor would disappear because the loving, playful atmosphere would turn into a hostile battleground. So they tune out to protect themselves. Now they have the same condition. I passed it on, but not genetically. We create the same conditions from one generation to the next. Addictions, I will finish with this. Um, are gonna, again, they're said to be uh, genetic brain disease or they're said to be a choice that people make. Well, I've worked with the most drug addicted people in North America you'll ever find. I didn't meet a single one who ever woke up one Saturday morning and said, oh, I'm going to choose to be an addict. That's complete nonsense. It's complete nonsense, but unfortunately, the legal system is based on that nonsense because we punish people for being addicted. And again, if you look at who's in the jails, it's not racially equal. It's very much color and racially based. So black kids, black young men, and I would imagine Hispanic young men, are more likely to find themselves in jail for the same crimes or for the same non-crimes related to drugs as Caucasians. Now, the second belief of addiction is that it's an inherited brain disorder. It's a disease. That's more humane, because at least if something is inherited, you're not going to blame people for it, are you? You're not going to punish them for it. You're going to treat them humanely. Well, that's good. That's a step forward. But it's not true. I'm going to ask for one more show of hands. I'm going to give you a defi definition of addiction that I don't think is controversial. An addiction is manifested in any behavior in which a person finds temporary relief, pleasure, and therefore craves, but then suffers negative consequences as a result of and doesn't give up despite the harm. So craving because of pleasure and relief, harm in the long term, and inability or refusal to give it up. That's what an addiction is. Please be aware that I said nothing about drugs. 
It could be the substances, legal, like nicotine or alcohol or caffeine. And by the way, many more people die of uh, diseases related to uh, the legal substances than the illegal ones. But the United States has got a major drug crisis now. Last year, over 100,000, 110,000 Americans died of overdoses, which means that in one year, more Americans died than in the Vietnam, Afghan, and Iraq wars put together. More than twice as many died in one year. So something's going on. And it can't be genetic, because genes, genes don't change over a few years or even a few decades. So let me give you this. So I've given you this definition of addiction. I said any behavior. So it could be substances. It could also be sex, gambling, shopping, eating, work, internet, internet gaming, cell phones, bulimia, almost any number of human behaviors. The issue is not the behavior. The issue is are you using it for relief or pleasure? Is it causing harm? Can you give it up? So here's what I'm going to ask you. I'm not going to ask you what or when, but just according to that definition, how many of you would acknowledge eating, of course? How, how many of you would acknowledge that one time or another in your life, you've had some kind of an addictive behavior? Just put your hand up. Okay. Again, most people. That's how common addictions are. No. If I was with you physically, now I would ask you a question. I would ask you not what's wrong with the addiction, but what's right about it. What did it do for you in the short term? And I can tell you the typical answers that I received to that question. People will say, stress relief. It numbed me. Now, when do people need to be numbed is when they're in pain. Pain relief made me feel more in control, uh, made me feel more alive gave me pleasure, gave me a sense of belonging. The absence of those qualities of belonging, being overstressed, sense of not being alive, these are painful states to be in. In other words, the addiction wasn't your primary problem. The addiction was your attempt to solve a problem. The problem of what? The problem of pain, emotional pain. So my mantra around addiction is, don't ask why the addiction, ask why the pain. Why the pain? When I worked in the downtown city of Vancouver, east side of Vancouver, I didn't have a, for 12 years, I didn't have a single female patient who had not been sexually abused as a child. Not one. All the men had suffered severe, severe neglect or abuse. So trauma is at the root of all these conditions. And these conditions are adaptations to trauma. You don't need to abuse kids, though, to traumatize them. Trauma means a wound. And you can wound kids, especially sensitive kids, not just by doing bad things to them that you shouldn't, which happens to a lot of kids. Like spanking. It's considered to be totally normal. You know what the studies show? The studies show that spanking in the long term is just as traumatic for kids as more severe forms of abuse. Because the child does not expect to be hit by the people nurturing them. And you know what? Aboriginal peoples, indigenous peoples, hunter-gatherer groups, they don't hit their kids. They don't. When the Europeans came to North America, they were surprised and appalled at the parenting practices of the indigenous people because they said, spare the rod, spoil the child. These people don't hit their kids. And they complained that the so-called Indians were so free and so individualistic and so um, unsuppressed. For the Europeans, this seems strange. So you can hurt kids, not just by doing bad things to them, but also by not meeting their needs. Their needs for unconditional loving acceptance, for being spared the work of having to look after their parents' emotional needs, they need the freedom to experience and, and have validated all their emotions. 
and they need to be able to play freely out there in nature, not at home with these addictive gadgets, but free play in nature. These are for the essential needs of, of children. If you don't meet them, they can be wounded. That's what trauma means. It means a wound. And what I'm saying to you to, to wrap this all up is that most conditions of mind and body that we consider to be sort of difficult to understand pathologies arise from stress and trauma that has to do with the expectations and parenting practices and stresses imposed on the family and the isolation, the increasing loneliness imposed on human beings by what I call a toxic culture. And that's the subtitle of the book, Trauma, Illness and Healing in a Toxic Culture. Finally, the good news, we can turn this around. If we can understand these dynamics, and even if illness shows up, if we get to know ourselves, reconnect with ourselves, I heal the traumas. I'm not promising a magical cure for everybody, but boy, there are so many documented examples of healing or remission. And certainly people can heal from mental health conditions. They can heal from addictions. They can heal from depression, from anxiety. But you've got to deal with the underlying trauma, the so-called illnesses or symptoms of underlying traumas. And unfortunately, um, this information, as I said before, is largely missing from medical schools. But the public is increasingly interested uh, in these subjects, as we know. And I'm not sure that 15 years ago, I would have been invited to the same conference. And the fact that myself and my colleagues who talk about trauma now are in such demand internationally has to do with an increasing recognition on the part of many people of these dynamics. But we're too busy that way because it's still, still um, not recognized nearly sufficiently, if at all, by the official institutional healing organizations. So, obviously, I could talk for four more hours on this subject, but I'll stop here and take any questions that you might like to throw my way. Thanks for listening. Thank you. So, um, hello, Dr. Gabor. Thank you so much. Uh, I am Gigi, by the way. Hi. <laughs> Um, we're going to do some Q&A right now, and we're going to do things a little bit differently. So okay. we're going to ask of you a few things. Um, we, we have a microphone here in the center so that Dr. Gabor can see you from the camera. And we're going to okay. ask you when, you're, when people are asking the question to look at Dr. Gabor at the camera, which is on that side right in front of Emmanuel. Now, what is a question? A question. So it's one huh. question, not three questions, because we want other people to ask. And also, don't start the conversation by telling Dr. Gabor all of your life story, although that would be wonderful. We don't have the time to do that. So if you could please very briefly say, um, this is my, my name is such and such, and this is my question. And ask one question. Would that be OK with everyone? OK, before anything, yeah, uh, Lucky. Well. I don't know, are we yeah. doing anything else? After. After, yeah. okay. Yeah. Um. Okay, so uh, who has any questions? And I know some of the people on Zoom have been asking if they could ask questions. Uh, we're gonna give priority for the people who are in person right now, and then okay. we're gonna move on. So um, we, we're gonna start uh, back there. Uh, yes, please come up. And if you can just come up, um, yeah. And then I think you had a question also right here on the left. You can right be behind her. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Mate. My name's Katrina. Hello. Um, I'm currently a medical student, so this is very interesting. Um, so I wanted to know what are, a lot of it seems like it should be from the patient side because it is like healing your own traumas. But on the physician side, what do you think can be done besides addressing like mental health issues and such? Like what else, what else can I as a future physician do for my patients? Well, uh, first of all, let me ask you a question. Yeah. Um, what year are you in? Second. Oh, I just finished my second. Okay. So soon. <laughs> How much of what you heard today have you heard in your medical school training? So we actually work, I go to FIU here in Miami, yeah. 
Yeah. Um, we actually do a lot of social determinants of health work. Okay. Um, so we what, do address social factors. Social determinants, yes. What about these emotional factors? Um, we, as the medical students, just really refer to like counseling um, or have a social worker. No, no, but are you taught about the connection between emotions and illness? No. So that's why. That's, I'm what, I'm that's what I'm talking about. Okay. Yeah, no, definitely. So, so um, my first recommendation is you need to be taught this stuff. Mm -hmm. and um, um, not exclusively but two of my books would be of interest to you one is the myth of normal that I've been talking about the other is a book called when the body says no that I wrote 24 years ago which means that if people don't know how to say no the body will say it in the form of illness okay. and both of these books are published internationally including uh, in the US so you need to acquaint yourself with this information so that when a patient comes to your office Yes, you will offer them the medical physiological treatments that are appropriate, but you will also um, guide them to look at the emotional side of things. So you need, to, you need to be educated about it. If the school won't educate you, you're going to have to educate yourself. Do you ever see that, that, that's, that? That's the first point. So the second point is your own stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, doctors are very stressed people. Have you been taught about telomeres or telomeres in medical school? Yeah, okay, great. So telomeres are DNA structures at the end of chromosomes. And um, they're meant to keep the chromosomes together like the aglets at the end of a shoelace keeps the shoelace from unraveling, the strands from coming apart. So telomeres seem to do the same things for chromosomes. And the older we get, the shorter our telomeres get. And the more stressed we are, the shorter telomeres get. So for example, mothers who are chronic caregivers to chronically your children have shorter telomeres and telomeres are like biological clocks so that it, black women in the states have shorter telomeres than white women not genetically but because of the stress of racism so now th the reason i say all this is because there, there was one study that looked at the telomeres of medical residents oh i don't want to know <laughs> And I hate to tell you, but they shortened, they frayed more rapidly than that of other people their age. Because nobody in medical school talks to you about looking after your own mental health. Well, they and do nobody medical, And nobody in medical school teaches you how to say no, for the most part. Uh, mostly you're taught to obey and to extend yourself infinitely and not look after yourself. And since, and I'll tell you one, a, a third thing as well. Um, who goes into medical school? Well, I don't know you personally, but speak about myself. Uh, I was idealistic. I wanted to help humanity. I'm sure you do too. And you might also want to go to medical school because you want a secure way of making a living, a, a, an interesting way of making a living. And that's a perfectly valid reason. But there's often an underlying, hidden, unconscious reason which in my case was that I had an unconscious need to be important and to be needed. And that came from my childhood. I'm not going to go into my own history right now. No, if you need to be needed and need to be important, you know what you do? Go to medical school. Because they're going to need you all the time when they're being born, when they're dying, and every minute in between. And you're going to be so important. And it's so addictive because you can never get enough of it. Because if, if you don't have that sense of importance and worthiness from within, it doesn't matter how much you get from the outside. So there's a lot of workaholic doctors out there. So I'm telling you, you got to deal with your stuff. And if you don't, you won't be able to help your patients either deal with their stuff. So those are my three recommendations. Thank you very much. That was awesome. Yeah. Okay. Hello, Dr. Mate. First of all, it's an honor to meet you. Uh, my name is Christine. My question is this. What are some practical ways to heal from post and current traumatic stress? Okay, well, important question. And it's very important for me to make a distinction. We tend to think that trauma is what happens to us. And... Um, 
like sexual abuse, or in my case, as an infant, separation from my mother due to the war, or a stressed family, or an alcoholic parent. So we tend to think that trauma is what happens to us. That's not what trauma is. Trauma means a wound. Literally, it's from a Greek word for wounding. So trauma is not what happens to us. And I make this clear in the very first chapter of the myth of normal. Trauma is what happens inside of us as a result of what happens to us. So for example, I get a blow on the head. That's not the trauma. That's the traumatic event. The trauma is the concussion. It's the wound. Psychologically, it's the same thing. Trauma is not what happened to you. Trauma is what happened inside you, the psychological wound that you sustained as a result of what happened to you. So let me give you two examples. I've already referred to them. Child is sexually abused. That's not the trauma. That's the traumatic event. You know what the trauma is? The child believes that they're worthless. The, the child believes that this happened to them because they deserved it. The child believes it's their fault. The child thinks that they're a shameful creature. Or the child believes that can only be validated if I'm sexually active. So they become promiscuous later on. In my case, not seeing my mother for being given to a stranger in the street by my mother to save my life, and I didn't see her for five weeks, that wasn't the trauma. The trauma was that I decided I wasn't lovable, that I wasn't important, that I wasn't worthy. That's the trauma. But that's the good news. Because if the trauma was what happened to you all those years ago, it's over, it's done. It happened. It'll never not have happened. But if the trauma is this wound that I'm not worthy or that I deserve to suffer, that we can heal. Now, how to do that? Well, I think for a lot of people, for most people, you need some kind of therapy. You need some, somebody to talk to, somebody who understands trauma. And a lot of psychologists do not. They get trained in behavior things, looking at symptoms rather than dealing with the underlying trauma. So you need to talk to somebody it doesn't even have to be a you know, a therapist, a counselor, anybody who's got some understanding of trauma um, with whom you can form a trusting relationship. So I think that for most of us, that's important. Secondly, there's all these um, books on the subject. I, you know, you can read them, it's not just mine, but for example, um, I can mention two, two or three right off the bat. Uh, there's... Um, the Boy Who Was Raised as a Dog by Bruce Perry. The, the book, uh, What Happened to You by Oprah and, and Dr. Bruce Perry. They're all my books. I'm not going to mention, I've already mentioned a few of them. Um, they were, I'm told all the time, literally I get emails from all over the world and I'm not saying this to, uh, to boast, although I am naturally pleased about it, but I get emails from all over the world thanking me, saying you saved my life just because somebody read one of my books. Um, or they saw a YouTube lecture, and that's another one. You can go on YouTube and see lots of great lectures on trauma by Bessel van der Kolk, whose book is "When the Body Keeps" or "The Body Keeps the Score," um, by other trauma experts, by myself. Check out the YouTube; free, it doesn't cost you a penny. Thirdly, self-care practices, looking at how you eat and what you eat. Now, eating is very often self-soothing of traumatic events. So looking at how you eat, how you treat your body, practices such as yoga or meditation to calm the nervous system, getting out there in nature, connecting with nature, all of these things. So there are many modalities out there. I myself teach a modality called compassionate inquiry, and we've had over 3,500 students in 80 countries in the last three or four years. Those of you that are therapists can think about taking that course. There's a short version of it for the public. You can get that. But I don't just want to sort of um, market my own work here. I'm telling you, there's a lot of resources out there. You have to look for them. And above all, you have to, you have to just make a commitment to yourself saying that I deserve this. And it wasn't my fault. And I can heal. 
And the good news is you can. That's a, I don't know if that's a short or long answer, but that's the best I can give you in a few minutes. Great answer, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just want to add, um, this is your first time here at Hope for Life. Uh, please make sure you stay a little bit and we can tell you we do this every Saturday, of course, not with Dr. Mate, but we have speakers here. We have we're a community that is dealing and going through the process of undoing our trauma. Yeah. So we're in a safe place here to talk about your story. And I would love to be part of that journey with you. That's great. Yes, Ma. Hello, Dr. Mate. Um, I wanted to thank you for addressing the um, traumas of um, black and brown people as there are some differentiations and uh, I have a passion for black and brown people to heal mentally physically and spiritually where can I start in healing racial trauma is it loving children one by one or in small groups and exposing them to various opportunities well if we can start in childhood that's the best and uh, the most important thing there is the relationship between the parents and the child now, what happens in the United States is that 25% of women have to go back to work within two weeks of giving birth. And mostly these are poor women, women of color, which means that 25% of kids lose the most important relationship of their lives, or at least that relationship is really jeopardized. Now, there was an article in the New Yorker magazine today about children who lost a limb in Gaza and thousands of kids have lost their limbs and some of them had to be operated on with no anesthetic. Can you believe it? Amputations with anesthetic? I mean, can you believe it? This is a war supported and funded by your country and by mine. But in the article, they quoted the psychologist who looks after these kids and he said, even these wounded kids don't necessarily need to be traumatized in the long term if they have a close relationship with their mom. So close human relationships are the best protection against trauma. So even terrible things can happen. But if there's close relationship between the adults and the child, then that can prevent the long-term traumatic effect. So that's the best one. Now, ideally, everybody who looks after kids, parents, daycare workers, teachers, counselors, legal personnel, um, physicians for sure, psychologists, they should all be trauma aware. And and they should be aware, which they're not, because they're not taught it. And they should be aware of the importance of the attachment relationship. Because the human brain develops, I'm quoting from an article from Harvard University 12 years ago, the human develops an interaction from birth until adulthood. And the most important influence on the development of healthy brain circuits is the child's relationship with the nurturing adults. So that's by far the most important dynamic. Okay, thank you. Thank you. It also means that a lot of the stuff that we look at kids as bad behaviors or diseases are not either bad behaviors or diseases. They are the outcomes of disturbed relationships with the adult world, which is not the fault of parents, because again, this society really has undermined the parenting environment in significant ways. So we're not faulting anybody here, but we're saying, let's deal with the conditions in which your kids grow up. And racism is a hard one. I mean, racism not only damages people emotionally, but it physiologically with the chromosomes. Also, racism causes inflammation in the body because that's what trauma does. So close relationships, community, these are the protections. <laughs> OK, 
Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Sophia. Um, I wanted to ask um, your mention about healthy anger piqued my interest. How can I express that anger without hurting myself or hurting the people around me? Well, um, tell me a bit more about your question. What do you mean by that? Like, let's say something someone says um, or something someone does crosses a boundary. I feel angry. How do I? Well, okay. Let, let's say I did that right now to you. Okay. okay. I said something intrusive or inappropriate, potentially hurtful. What would you say to me? I mean, thinking what I'd usually do, I'd probably no, just... Um, what would you like to say to me? <laughs> <laughs> uh... <laughs> you say, no, back off. That's what you would say in one form or another. Yeah. I mean, I'd like it. But that's what you have to say, wouldn't it? That's what it looks like. And once you said it, it's gone. Like it, if it's a healthy anger, the thing about healthy anger is not rage, where you become a, a raging lunatic, you know? That's something else. That's unhealthy anger. Healthy anger is no, boundary, no. And once you've expressed it and it's done its job, it's over, it's gone. It's in the present moment. Well, why would that hurt me? And if it does, it's my problem. If I assume that I have the right to intrude on your space emotionally or physically, and, 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 and if I don't happen to like the fact that you set a boundary, that's my problem. Why would you worry about my reaction to that? So healthy anger, again, is a boundary um, protection. It's in the moment. And once it's done its job, it's gone. That's healthy anger. And if you don't know how to do that, believe me, you did the day you were born. So something happened. The, what, this tension between authenticity and attachment arose in your life or people's lives when you were small. And naturally, you automatically went for the attachment. And now asserting yourself seems dangerous and strange to you because that's how you survived. Well, you have to unlearn that. Okay? All right, thanks. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, just so you know, Sophia, when we finish with our uh, forgiveness series, which is in about four weeks, we go into a series that we talk about anger. We have two, possibly three classes where we learn to express healthy anger. So we welcome you to come and join us as well. Wonderful. Dr. Mate, thank you so much for everything you do. You're amazing. Uh, my name is Andres Medellin. I, I think so, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> who am I to know? Okay, sorry. To me, <laughs> you're amazing. To me and my wife. Um, my name is Andres Medellin. I've been fighting human trafficking through soccer since 2010 here in Miami. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> thank you. I have seen and heard all kinds of horrible things. Yeah. My question to you today is, how would you approach people to help them learn how to prevent human trafficking without triggering them or scaring them away? Well, now, I have to say this is an area where you're experienced and I'm not. Um, but who are these people that you're trying to teach here? Who are the ones that you would want to educate that way everyone no, but, <laughs> everyone well, that will listen well uh i don't know exactly what to say to that because i don't think anybody in this room um or listening online is not appalled by the very idea of human trafficking so i'm not sure what they need to be taught you'll I'm, be surprised i, 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 su I suppose the real issue is who gets trafficked and what are the conditions under which this trafficking can take place? Mm -hmm. And who gets trafficked 
are usually vulnerable young people, mm -hmm. usually vulnerable young women who don't have enough support in their own families, or their own families are too stressed, or the families are broken, um, mm -hmm. whom the traffickers can possibly um, uh, groom or, 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 or seduce or, or um, tempt by various promises who are gullible. And the, the question there is, what creates the conditions for that? And oh my God, there's so many conditions in the Latin American countries, if that's what you're referring to, but, oh, also, but also, you know, other places in the world where there's so much stress, so much trauma, so much social dislocation that these young people are just um, available. And so apart from the work that you're doing, the work that some dedicated law enforcement people are doing, it's a question of what are the conditions that um, generate human trafficking? And those are large political and social questions, which we have to address. And of course, typically our politicians don't address those questions. In fact, nope. if anything, their policies even make them worse. Yes. And, and, and you talk about healing trauma, so that goes a long way to ending human trafficking. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank All right, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Christian. Um, how do you deal with trauma from an assault? Well, uh, again, <clears throat> remember what I said, an assault does not need to be traumatic. You, you know when it's traumatic? Yeah. Like, not everything that's painful and stressful is traumatic. Everything that's traumatic is painful and stressful. But people can have stress, people can have pain without being traumatized. Trauma, again, is not what happened to you. Trauma is what happened inside you as a result of what happened to you. And so two people can be, two people can be assaulted. One will not be traumatized, the other one will be. What makes the difference? This might be emotionally difficult for some of you. Um, so I just warn you about that. I've worked with a lot of people who were sexually assaulted in childhood or adolescence. And the question I asked them is, how long did it go on for? And they'll say maybe a week or seven years and anything in between. And the next question I'll ask is, who did you talk about it? You know what the answer is almost all the time? Nobody. So the trauma is not just what happened to you, but also that you were left alone with it. By the time you were assaulted, by the time you were assaulted, you were so alone, you learned that there was no support for you, that you suppressed it. That's what creates the trauma. So, when you ask, how do you help somebody being assaulted from being traumatized? By listening to them, by validating their experience, by teaching them that they didn't invite it, they didn't deserve it, it's not their fault. Thank you. That's how. It's uh, being left alone with it. That's what creates the long-term wound. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Hello, what an honor to be able to ask you a question, Dr. Gabor Mate. My name mm -hmm. is Lina, and my question is in regards to the, the fine line between medicating and not medicating in the sense like, as a matter of fact, this question came to me when your son was here. He talked about um, the cyclothymia and discovering yeah. he had that and then making the choice to take medication yeah. so what would you say like where do you make that call right so um i'm not against medications i've taken them myself for example i've taken antidepressants <clears throat> and um actually the reason i took antidepressants because i was so emotionally unregulated when my kids were small i go into these rages sometimes and my kids were afraid of me his cyclothemia has a lot to do with how I was as a father. 
by the way, him and I are writing another book together now. Um, <laughs> it's called Hello Again, a fresh, a fresh Start for Parents and Adult Children, based on a workshop that we do. So I've taken antidepressants, but they're not the answer because they only deal with symptoms. That may be a useful thing to do, nothing wrong with it, but they don't deal with the underlying problem. So my, my issue with medications, especially in children, but also in adults, is that doctors are too quick to prescribe them without exploring other avenues first. And even when they pre do prescribe them, they're not the answer. They are helpful for symptom relief, but you gotta deal with the underlying trauma. So if you're gonna take medications, see them for the most part, for the most part, as a temporary support while you deal with the issues rather than as here's the answer. Right. So now how do you make that call? Look, um, if it interferes with your functioning in a significant way, whatever issue you're dealing with, then you can consider medication. If you're depressed all the time or angry all the time, you know, you know, aggressive all the time or, or, or you can't sleep, you can't eat or you eat too much, I mean, whatever, you know, um, you can consider medication. There are only two possibilities. Either they will work or they won't. If they don't work, you stop them. Or they can cause side effects or not cause side effects. If they cause side effects you don't like, you stop them. They don't take away your powers of decision making. So I can tell you in my case, <clears throat> I took medication in my 50s. I just turned 80. I don't take medications for a long time now. For either my ADHD or for my depression. I just don't need them. I got ways of coping with them. I've learned a lot about myself. I've... Uh, healed a lot of my traumas um, deeply. I've developed practices that support me, body and soul. I'm never gonna need medication again as long as I live. I mean, I'm confident of that. So um, I'm neither against or for, it's a question of what else do we do? Right. Okay. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. Hi there, my name is Ileana. Thank you for being with us and answering our questions. My question is, um, actually it goes a little bit in what she was talking to you about. Um, basically, I wanted to know from what I understood you said before that it's not genetically, um, if you have uh, schizophrenia or um, bipolar disorders, does, is that still genetically or not? They're not determined genetically. I think they both happen to people who are genetically very, very sensitive. And what happens to sensitive people, do an experiment with me right now, okay? Just tap yourself on the shoulder like this, would you? How much did that hurt you? Not at all. Not at all. But now imagine that your shoulder was bare and um, there was a burn there. So that means your nerve endings were close to the surface. Now, if you tap yourself with the same force, what would happen? It would hurt. Severe pain, right? Mm -hmm. Even though the external event was the same, because you're mm -hmm. more sensitive, you felt more. So these sensitive people, when traumatic events happen, they're much more affected by it. There's all kinds of evidence linking, for example, psychosis to traumatic events in childhood. Um, not everybody who gets traumatic events gets psychosis. But the more you experience trauma, the greater the risk for psychosis. So they're not determined genetically, but there's a predisposition as genetic. And so it's an interaction of environment, but a, pre, but a predisposition. I'm sorry, they're not predetermined genetically, but there's a genetic predisposition. Now, predisposition is not the same as a predetermination. The predetermination says, says this will happen no matter what. The, mm. predispos the predisposition says this is more likely to happen given certain circumstances. So if my great grandmother, my grandmother, my yeah. mother, my sister all had, you know, schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a few cases. I think there are a few cases when it is genetic few cases where it's you know i mean you can see there's clusters in certain families i think that's true but that's the minority of cases okay, okay. and yeah. and even and even then i think this i would I, i'd want to look at the 
histories of your relatives what happened to them in childhood well you know i i mean i'm not i can't open that conversation now but i'd be very interested to see what happened there right but medication you, is something that has to go on those people because i can't yeah. Make it up. thank you Bien. thank you so much okay Hi, my name is Maria and I'm starting psychology. So Hi. you mentioned that today psychologists have been trained more from a behavioral perspective. Yeah. So my question is, what would you say is a possible danger of looking at mental issues just from a behavioral <coughs> perspective? I'm sorry, can you say the question again? What is the... What will you say is a possible danger of looking at mental issues from a behavioral, just from a behavioral cognitive perspective? Okay. Um, if you went to a mechanic with your car, because your engine was rattling, and the um, mechanic says, well, uh, let's just deal with the rattling. So put on some uh, head headphones so you don't hear the rattling. How, how helpful would that be? Not very helpful. You'd want to know exactly what happened to the engine. Yeah. Now, these behaviors are just symptoms. That's what they are. Whether it's compulsive, obsessive compulsive behavior or anxious behaviors or aggressive behaviors or anger management problems, these are symptoms. There's an underlying emotional drive beneath them. Those underlying emotional drives originated in childhood, in how your personality was formed and how your brain was shaped. So let's deal with the underlying issues. I don't say ignore the behavioral issues, but don't limit it to that. So that's the danger. Okay, thank you. Hello, good evening. Um, good. My name is Joely. Thank you for your time. Um, so my question is gonna go off of Sophia's question about um, suppressing anger. I think um, my question is like, it's when we're not being, when we don't want something, we say no. But what about when we do want something that we're not getting? What does healthy anger look like then or not suppressing? Can you give me an example? For example, I'm not gonna use my husband because I love him a lot. I'm gonna use my mom because she's not here. So um, let's say I would like for my mom to affirm the decisions that I'm making in my life or- Well, let me ask you a question. Yeah. Why, would, why do you want that? I'm that, sorry. Like a, that? That may seem like a silly question, but why do you want that? Why do I want affirmation from my mom? Yeah. yeah. Um, Why do you think you need it? I want to be seen by her, heard by her, understood. Okay. Well, that's natural. We all do. Yes. How do you feel when you don't get that? I think right now I'm starting to feel the anger of not having okay. gotten it and wanting it. Still. Okay. Got it. Now, let me ask you a couple of questions, okay? Okay. Um, if your mom was blind, literally, and she couldn't see you, would you be angry with her? No. If your mom was deaf and couldn't hear you, would you be angry with her? No. Okay. Well, let me tell you something. If your mother doesn't see you, it's because she's blind. Emotionally speaking. Why is she blind emotionally speaking? Because something happened to her in childhood that she didn't want to see. Mm -hmm. So she shut down her emotional awareness. Therefore, she couldn't see you either. Are you with me? Yeah. So she is to some extent blind. Okay. Yeah. That's the first point. The second thing is at your age, as an adult, we don't need our parents to see us. We don't need them. 
but we needed them when we were small. And what I'm suggesting to you is that your pain right now and not being seen by your mother in the present is actually trauma from the past. Because there was a time when you did need her to see you. That's one of the needs of children is to be seen by their parents. And your mother couldn't give you that. So what I'm saying is that this anger that comes up for you is legitimate, but it's not about the present. And even if the mother could give you the seeing now, it would not give you the healing for the pain of not having been seen when you needed it. So it's your issue, not hers. You need to deal, heal your own trauma and not try and get something from your mother in the present that even if she gave it to you, it wouldn't heal you. Are you, are you with me? Yeah. Okay. So That's... This, 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 um, this, this, this new book that this new book that my son Daniel and I are working on, Hello Again, a fresh start for adults, parents, and adult children. There'll be a lot of uh, information about this stuff. There's one more thing I want to say to you. Yeah. Your mother senses in you a kind of demand. And, and a kind of the kind of anger that you just begin to get in touch with, she senses it. And that makes her feel defensive. And when people feel defensive, they shut down more rather than open up more. So the more you deal with your non-existent need in the present to be seen by her, and the more you deal with the real trauma that you suffered, by not having been seen by her a long time ago, the more you deal with all that, the less demanding you will be of her that she gives you now something that she's always had difficulty giving, and the more likely she's to be less defensive, and the more likely she's to see you. That's the second point. There's a third point. Do you see her? Do you see her? I try to, but that's not what I, I didn't ask if you try to. Okay, um, not fully. Because no, you don't. Because if you saw her, you saw the blindness that she has, and that she didn't deliberately develop that blindness. That's what you would see. Okay. That's good. So, so you work on healing your own trauma. Um not demanding that she gives you something that even if she gave you, it wouldn't heal you. And if you want to, you can work on seeing her. Now, you don't have to take the third one on because in a certain sense, all your life, you've been trying to deal with her stuff. So you may not feel like doing that right now. I'm not saying you should. I'm just saying these are the avenues to ease the pain that you have right now and the anger that you have. Okay? Thank you. And You're shout welcome. out to Hope for Life for helping me with that. Good evening, doctor. How are you? Thank you so much for your time. My name is Evan, and you briefly briefly spoke about genes. Um, if I could ask you if you would be able to answer, what would you do with information from genetic testing, for example, such as the BRCAN gene? The which gene? The Bracken breast cancer. Oh, well, there are such genes. I mean, I'm not saying the genes don't play any role at all. There are a few diseases that are purely genetic. One right. runs in my family. Multiple, it's, it's called um, muscular dystrophy. Okay. My mother had it. My aunt had it. If you got the gene, somebody in my generation, one of my siblings has it. If you get the gene, you get the disease. It's like 99% for sure, okay? Now, with breast cancer, there are some genes that make it much more likely for you to have breast cancer than if you don't have the gene. So there are these genes, like Angela Jolie, very famously, she had these genes for, she had a double mastectomy to, to prevent her getting breast cancer. That was a totally valid decision. But here's the interesting news. Out of 100 women with breast cancer, you know how many actually have the gene? Seven out of 100. 93 do not. So most women that develop breast cancer don't carry those genes. 
That's okay. the first. The second point is, even of the women who have some of these genes, not all of them will get breast cancer. So the genes, in that case, in the case of muscular dystrophy, the genes are 100% determinant. In the case of breast cancer, they're not 100% determinant, but they certainly elevate the risk. But they're not present in most cases. And what is present in most cases, or virtually all cases of breast cancer, is those four traits that I mentioned. Basically, of disconnection from the self, self-suppression, looking after others, like a quoted shell of crow. So that's what's really present in most of the cases. That's not genetic. Okay? Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi. Good evening, Dr. Mate. It's a pleasure meeting you. And um, I just have to say um, to um, Giovanna, who first told me about you, um, and since she told me about you, I've watched almost all your videos on, online, and I've learned so much, so thank you. But I have a question back to the sensitive child. How do you determine um, if a child is sensitive? By how much they react to the same stimulus. Like, uh, you can have two kids, and uh, one of them will kind of shrug things off, you know, but the other will react very severely to whatever happens. They react, by the way, very, to both stimuli, whether they're negative or positive stimuli, they react with more vivacity and more energy and just more emotion. But parents can usually tell. Okay. Yeah, because, um, you know, it's like you have more than one child and you say, oh, this child behaved this way and the other one did, um, doesn't. And so that's what you're referring to as being sensitive. Well, that, yes, but that's not all. So there's temperament, uh, genetic temperament, uh, sensitivity, but there's something else. I'm going to say something maybe that might strike you as surprising, but no two children have the same parents. And no two children have the same families. And no two children have the same childhoods in the same family. Why? A, a, birth order. Parents treat a first child differently than a second child. Not that they love one more than the other, but naturally, the two kids are not treated the same way, number one. Number two, the first child has got the experience of being the only one getting all the parents' attention. The second one never gets that. Secondly, the second child... Um, uh, has always got a, a bigger companion to compete with or to try and fit in with. Thir thirdly, the first child, the second child doesn't get the insult. Oh, here I was the only one, the kind of the center of my parents' attention. All of a sudden I have a competitor. The second child is a competitor right away in the older child. Furthermore, the parents might be in a different emotional state between the birth of one child or the other. Economically, it might be in a different situation. Their relationship might be different. And then there's temperament. But even if all those conditions were the same, they would experience it differently, depending on what temperament they have. So there's all these factors. So don't be surprised. if, And even identical twins don't have the same experiences. And they don't don't have the same brains, even though genetically they're totally identical. So much depends on the environment, which is a good thing, because genes there's nothing we can do with, but the environment we can do a lot about. But don't be surprised that kids in the same family, you say, oh, this, I was the same parent. No, you weren't. It's the same family. No, it wasn't. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Mate. Um, thank you so much for coming. Um, oh, this way. Sorry, I'm facing the wrong way. Um, my name's Toby, and I'm a primary care doctor, but I kind of hate being pigeonholed as a doctor. Mm -hmm. All the conversations get derailed often. Um, <laughs> I'm sure you can relate to. But one of my questions is, when I see patients who have mental health needs that, you know, medicines are a band-aid, what I see is that patients getting access to good therapists is super hard. It's expensive. Yeah. Most people can't yeah. afford it. Um, many don't take insurance. And so I guess my focus question is, what would you recommend for a primary care doctor to do 
you know, to be able to, I mean, help patients in that setting, given the system's restraints? Oh, gosh. I mean, the, the system is very restrictive. Um, access to psychiatrists is often limited. But to tell you the truth, the approach of psychiatrists is also very limited very often. They deal with the symptoms and the biological things or the drugs, but they don't deal with the underlying issues. I don't know what to tell you. Um, I don't know what resources for peer counseling that might be in your area, what support groups might exist. Um, I know that I myself developed my counseling skills, not because of any training that I had, but because simply I didn't know where to refer anybody. Because my patients could not afford psychologists, private psychologists, it was a working class neighborhood. Um, and uh, secondly, within the medical system, I didn't know who to refer them to. So I myself began to spend it every day of each day. I'd bring in people and say, well, come in, let's talk for half, half an hour. So I don't know how to answer your question because with insurance being what it is in the States, but even here in Canada and the paucity of services, um, I recommend uh, whatever online support groups there might be. I recommend these books. I recommend these YouTube lectures people can watch. Um, you can certainly, even meditation practices can help a lot of people uh, if they're together enough to pursue them. That doesn't cost much money. Um, whatever support you, you can provide, whatever listening you can provide, but truly, uh, I don't have a satisfactory answer for you. Thank you. I mean, even listening is an answer that's helpful. So thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, listening is big. They can do that. We can certainly do that. Okay. Um, I'm going to answer something similar to what we said before. Um, this is a community where there's uh, support groups every Thursday, men and women who are dealing with their family of origin story. And we have free uh, workshops and classes every Saturday. So that would be a great place to start until you find something closer to the hospital, perhaps, or wherever you're um, seeing the patients. But look around you. This is a community that has those conversations. And most of us are not therapists, but we're learning our story. And we can hear their story and hold space for their story. And that's more than they are receiving. So. That's my invitation to you. I hope people take me up on it. I give the cards away all the time. Yes. <laughs> Keep them coming. And our last question uh, here. Thank you. Hello, Dr. Mate. My name is Chris. And uh, my wife and I, we have a six and four year old, two girls. And we're trying to figure out how to deal with our six year old's healthy anger <laughs> and respecting her boundaries and being supportive and well, tell me what you mean by her quote unquote healthy anger when she just has a fit of rage because her sister did something that upset her oh. okay, um, so, example. okay so okay so here's the thing <clears throat> children's um children act out right <clears throat> we, we talk about children acting out <clears throat> but what does it mean to act out well, one way she acts out is these fits of rage, right? But what does the phrase acting out means? Acting out means that we portray in behavior something we haven't got the words for it to say in language. So, for example, in a game of charades where you're not allowed to speak, you have to act it out, right? So your daughter is acting something out. And what is she acting out? Her frustration. Why is she frustrated? Now, I, don't know, I don't know you and your family. I don't know you and your spouse. But I'm speaking in general terms. It's for you to decide whether my words fit your situation or not. I can't assume that they do. So I'm speaking in general. Kids mostly act out. Their, their, their rage is a sign of frustration. When are we frustrated? When our needs aren't met. Now, the child's biggest need is the attachment relationship with the parent. And your elder child 
did not ask for a younger child to be brought into the family. That wasn't her call. She didn't ask for the competition to enter the home. Number one. Why wouldn't she be angry about it? Number one. Number two. I don't know what your family life has been like. Um, I don't know how emotionally available you've been to your children. I wasn't very available to mine, as I was saying to you. But what this child needs, she's got an intense frustration. What she need, and, and the biggest need she has is to be accepted and validated and enjoyed. So I'm going to make you two suggestions for you. One is a practical behavior one. The other is a reading one, okay? The behavior one is twofold. One is when she acts out like that, you got to say no, no hitting your sister or no yelling, you know? You got to say that. But don't, don't get angry about it. Don't get triggered about it. She's not doing it deliberately. It's automatic behavior on her part. She's not a bad kid. So don't hold it against her. Number one. Number two, once the fit is gone, reestablish the relationship with her. Really grab her and hug her and love her and play with her and enjoy her. Collect her. And then you can say to her, sweetheart, when you got angry then, when you yelled and when you threw that thing or whatever you did, you must have been very angry. Yeah. Well, can we find some ways of expressing your anger that aren't so difficult or so hurtful? I know you don't mean to be that way, but there's a lot of anger there. And can we find some way of expressing your anger? Can you draw me an angry picture right now? Or can you say, Daddy, I'm angry? So, But before you can teach them that, you have to collect them and make them feel very relaxed and safe. So that's the first behavioral suggestion, okay? The second one is stuff her full of loving attention till it's coming out of her ears. Because her behavior, in a certain sense, she's looking for attention. Oh, she's just looking for attention. I'm right, she is. And the kids, if they don't get the attention they need, they'll get the attention they'll get at whatever the cost. So give her attention that she hasn't asked for. So when she's not asking for it, sweep her up and say, hey, let's hang out together. Give her some only time. Volunteer it. Both you and the mother should volunteer only time to your eldest child. It should come from her. No, no. It should come from you enthusiastically. So don't fake it. When you got the energy for it, hey, come here. We have, I haven't seen you for 10 minutes. I miss you. Let's do something together. Okay. I promise you, in a month, those behaviors will change. Okay? Those are the behavior ones. There's one more. Whatever tension, relationship issues you might have in your home between the parents, deal with them so she doesn't have to absorb them. And fourthly, I've co-written a book called Hold On to Your Kids that just being republished in the States in a couple of weeks with a new chapter. Get that book. It's got Hold On to Your Kids, Why Parents Need to Matter More Than Appears. It was first published close to 20 years ago. It's been published in over 30 countries now. It's going to save your bacon in that book. And I can very confidently and without egotism tell you that because I'm not the main author. The main author is a psychologist friend of mine called Dr. Gordon Neufeld. And you guys, Gigi and others here, Giovanna, if, if you ever want to invite a parenting expert to talk to you, talk to my friend Gordon who's the main author of Hold On To Your Kids, is the, West, is the world's best resort as to how to relate to kids. So I'm telling you, read that book, follow my advice. In a month, that's going to change, I promise you. Okay? That's very helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you. What, what was your name? What was your name? What was your name? Chris, something that Lackey says here and Giovanna says here all the time is, when we get well, our children get well. And I invite you to come on Saturdays, join us. You will have, a lot of us have the same questions all the time. So, uh, Lucky, um, I think you have something to say. I want to thank everyone for these questions were fantastic. And Dr. Gabor, 
it's like I'm speechless. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, you have given words to my um, to my infant child inside of me that was very traumatized and re-traumatized most of my life. So it's really soothing to listen to your wisdom with so much compassion. And I know I speak for all of us. So thank you, thank you, thank okay. you. Uh, thank you. Lucky. Thank you. Uh, I just want to say one more thing. Thank you also. But also, I just want to uh, express my appreciation for your work. I mean, you've created something um, not as experts and as professionals, but as just humane people who wanted to build and reach community. And, and you've done that. And I'm just so appreciative. I wish it happened in many more places. Thank you. And with that, I'm going to say good night to you. Thank you so much. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll call him in a few hours and <laughs> talk to him myself. Wasn't this amazing? Yeah. I mean, I mean, this is this is our heart. This is what we want to do here. And I know many of you. This is your first time here. Some of you. We just want to remind you: we are a non-for-profit organization. And. Toby, to go to Toby's question that he asked, this was in our heart. We knew the trauma we had, the mess we made in our home. Um, when he was saying, have doctor asked you, one of our, we have, we're the parents of four children, two adult, three adult children, 37, 36, 30, and we have an 18 year old and seven grandkids. And when our 30 year old was a child, he suffered from severe asthma. And I remember we took him everywhere, everywhere. He went from hospitalization to doctors. Nobody knew what to do. And I remember one day one doctor said, this is, this is not health related. There's something going on with him. This is, he's expressing something. And he was the head of pulmonologist at Miami Children's. And I remember the question he asked is, how is your husband's and yours relationship? What is going on in the house? And do you know what my answer was? Everything's perfectly fine. We're perfect. <laughs> We're perfect, we said. I said. <laughs> We're fine. There's no problem. We get on so well. He's actually the best of our children and in total denial. And because of the mess we saw, and the mess we saw people suffering out, out there, but like Toby said, there's a lot of people cannot afford to pay to a conference to Dr. Gabor. They cannot pay for conferences to go and, and see, they cannot afford psychologists or counseling. You know, we have so many people here that tell me it's not in my budget. I can, we cannot afford it. So our heart here is that we can provide that. As a community, we all come together and we can provide that. We bring speakers like this all the time. And I tell you right now, soon before you know it, the guy that hold that book, hold your children tight, he's gonna be here because we will bring him. It took five years to bring him, we will bring no, him. Five years to bring <laughs> Gabor Mate, we will. And this is what we do. So if I invite you, if you want to support this, if you want to know more about it, go to our website. And these are different ways that you can support this work. I think it's amazing what we're doing here because there's so many people out there that cannot afford what we are doing right here. And we do get resistance. Believe it or not, we do get resistance because people are questioning, oh, what is this place? What are they doing there? But if you can speak to people that have been coming here, we unravel and we undo our traumas together. And I said earlier, we get wounded by people, we get healed around people that are trying to do the same thing. The, the book that Dr. Gabor talked about with Bruce Perry and Oprah Winfrey, if you've all read it, I have. I've read every book out there actually, but we won't go in. No, I really have, I'm not kidding. I had so much trauma 
the sun she's talking about, when we finally did the work with that sun, he stopped coughing. These are facts. This is medical stuff. No, no, our son was in hospital every year. He went to the best pulmonologist in Miami and Miami Children's. And his question from this guy said, what's wrong at home? And you know what we said? Nothing. Now it's been 15 years since that visit with the doctor. And about 10 years ago, she said, she did something about that with the son. And from having chronic asthma, he doesn't cough anymore. This is a fact. We're not making these stories up as we go along and lying to people, you know. There are people in this room now that have been coming for years. They're getting well. Their kids are getting well. Their families, ask them. The new people who've never been here, ask, speak to the people in the room. These are facts, right? We can't make them up as we go along. You know, and the, uh, the book he mentioned from uh, Dr. Perry and Oprah, we have it out there. They said there's only one way to get well. You can go to therapy every week. They said that in the book, all they do, which is wonderful, they open up the blueprints and they do nothing. Then they roll it back up and you come back next week. And they said without a community that is in healing, it's in the book that he quoted, that Dr. Gabor quoted, you will not stay and you will not get well. Go read the book. It's out there. He quoted it, not me, by Dr. Bruce Perry. I can quote all the book he's quoting because I've read him. Because I, was a, I used to cheat on my wife. I used to treat my children like shit. These are facts. People who know me in the room know this for a fact. But I'm getting better every day. But it's been a work for 30 years. It didn't start with Gabor. And I work on myself all the time. This is a, these are facts. People in the room who know, some people have known me for 25 years in this room. Sorry. <laughs> well, he is getting better, yes. So with that said, thank you for being here. If this is your first time and you would like to support, these are the different ways. And if you for, want to support us, still come on this. Still come on yeah. uh, Saturdays, and you will get well. I tried to commit suicide twice in 1993. These are facts. So, 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 thank you for being here. For those that are here, for those that this has been alive for eight and a half years, June 13 of this year is going to be nine years since we opened our doors. I can tell you one thing. We started this in a tiny little room, that side, close that door, it was that size. There's people sitting here that started with us in that little room with two people, three people, then four people. Then we outgrew that room, we went to another room. And we are very proud to say that because of the generosity of people that have come alongside, we were able to purchase this property two years ago. And we started this with zero money and not knowing what we were gonna do. And look where we are. So I just, those people that have supported us for eight and a half years, for three years, for five years, for four years, I wanna say tonight, thank you. This is possible because of your generosity and because of what you've done. And we wanna that thank you sense. from the bottom of our hearts. And if you wanna continue doing this and we wanna see more speakers like this, then you know what to do. So thank you, have a wonderful oh, night and thank you for being oh. here. God bless you. <laughs> we also have Spanish groups and, and support groups. So if you know someone that speak Spanish, they can come. Thank you.